Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast put on by three dudes. But we come before you in auspicious times. We, as three dudes, are deeply divided. <laughs> uh-huh. There are opinions and views floating about that threaten to tear us apart. How can we navigate these choppy waters? All that and more on this episode <laughs> of Classical Stuff. This is like the my name, for the I think you're overpromising. More? <laughs> my name is Graham Donaldson, and I am here with Thomas Fletcher Magby. Hello. And Arthur Yon. A.J. Hannenberg. Wow. That's an extra middle name, but I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, no problem. And we are classical teachers at a classical Christian school in Austin, Texas called Veritas Academy. And weeks ago, mere weeks, we floated an innocent podcast out there into the world on an innocuous topic of conversation called heresy. How could it go wrong? <laughs> How, How could that go wrong? It didn't go wrong, but we <laughs> have, it has elicited wonderful, amazing feedback mm-hmm. into flooded our inbox and those birds of Twitter have plopped those replies and retweets on our decks, the decks of our hearts. And what? <laughs> okay. And so Thomas has felt compelled uh, to uh, take up the topic yet again. Or I don't know. I don't know what you're doing. Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what if, what if you, what, and I'm not, I realize I ran out of rope. I'm, like, actually, I don't know what's I'm going not going to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be really messed up. Yeah. It's like, nah, actually, I'm just going to talk about trees. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, Jokes so, on you, chumps. Uh-huh, I got you. If you talk about trees, I'm going to leave. Oh, thank you. Oh, my word. Okay. Okay, let's branch out into something different. Donaldson. <laughs> you've, you've got roots here. Yeah, that's true. This mm-hmm. is embarrassing. So, yes, this is... In originally thinking about this episode, it We'd was like... pine for you. Uh, <laughs> It's, it was like all the, uh, my, the original prompt was going to be See, like, dare what you've done. Oh you've <laughs> Man, that was a pretty, pretty bad joke. This is so sad right now. This is going to be an episode about sadness and what I experience in recording. No, just kidding. Okay. So yeah, the original, the original thought was going to be, you have more jokes. I see you all. No, I, to I do, but we're not going to. You're going to save them for later. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm holding one, but I'll just keep it in my palm. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I mean, I'm, you're barking up the wrong tree on this one. <laughs> no winning. There's no winning. That was pretty naughty, Grant. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Going the, against the grain? Uh, All right, I'll stop. That's, <laughs> we're up to like 20 already. I'm kind of impressed. Let's branch off. You, that's the second time you've made that no, one. I feel like that's a party foul. That's Sorry. all I got. <laughs> so, oh, I thought you were going to go for Okay. So the original concept was just going to be things that I wish I'd clarified more when I talked about them last time. So... That would include the translation episode in addition to the heresy episode, but we'll talk about translation probably later if we talk about it at all. So, yes, the main thing to talk about here is kind of a follow-up to the heresy episode. And similarly to the previous episode, I'm more interested... This is, so we do this... It's, it's classical stuff you should know. So there are... Yeah, I'm interested in like the classical aspect of it. I'm I'm interested in the takeaways about heresy more so than individual heresies. I said that last time. I'll just repeat it again in case anyone looks at this and says that I didn't go into enough detail. It's because it's kind of not my goal. My goal is not here to like teach you theology because that's not really in the scope of classical stuff. You should know. Is that fair? You disagree? Graham just like looked horrified that I said that. Uh, I don't know. How can you not teach theology? It's all around us. Okay. <laughs> uh carefully i don't know so at, at one level we're just going to be coming back we're coming back to the main one on impassibility and mm-hmm. theopask theopascism theopascatism you'll see it stylized both ways so just as our fun reminder of what that is so the controversy being addressed uh, was about suffering so it was about whether christ and his divine nature was capable of suffering so let's actually zoom back even farther the bulk of our time in the previous episode was going through some early heresies that all related to the character of Christ. And the reason for that is that understanding the character of Christ is a really complicated thing. And so there had to be these disagreements to figure out what exactly was believed about who this person was, because it's really hard to wrap your mind around someone being fully man and fully God. Mm -hmm. So there were some misunderstandings about him. And so those misunderstandings related to whether he was created or not, well, so like, was he actually God? Uh, then the next question was, was he actually a human or was he just kind of pretending to be a human? Did he have 
a joined together identity or did he have kind of two separate, there was like a human Christ and like a divine Christ and he would switch between them. Like a partitioned hard drive. Yeah. Partitioned so that they wouldn't, that they didn't, they didn't really impact each other, but they were two separate ones. And also the final question was, did Christ have this like third separate nature that wasn't human? It wasn't divine. It was a mixing of the two. So some third type. And the answers were, he wasn't created. He was in fact really human. He did not have a split identity. He was both fully man and fully God. And then he did not have a third hybrid nature. So those were the answers to those first. Mm -hmm. Although that's the orthodox position of of Christ's nature, which isn't to say that no one since then has believed. Or that there aren't people who believe those things mm-hmm. or say those things, uh, but the, the or functionally operate as if out as if those things are not true. Like sure. they functionally operate under a different. They may you know say, oh yeah, totally, Christ is one hundred percent man, one hundred percent God. But then the way that they practically preach or talk about him is not. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of I know we're yeah we got a really great email about about the difference between holding heretical views and then wielding heresy to to divide the church, which I thought was a really helpful distinction. Yep. Anyway. And that, so we started with those four. We went in, we were going to do like kind of a rapid fire of remaining heresies. And we got stuck on like the second one on the list. So we didn't do a <laughs> rapid fire of heresies, which I'm not going to attempt today either. But the, the one we got hung up on last time was theopascatism. It was whether Christ and his divine nature was capable of suffering. Mm-hmm. And we didn't really have time to dive into it. So I wanted to spend some more time here because it seemed like there was lots of conversation we could have had and did not. So the the more interesting question, I think, and please feel free to disagree, is how do we, how do we even go about answering a question like this? So we have a question about, uh, yeah, essentially, yeah. How do you approach a question that you don't know the answer to? I dig my heels in and okay. <laughs> don't listen to opinions on the other side. That's that's a good one. Okay, I like good. I like where you had that. Yeah, we got that from Twitter. We got that. Yeah. Is that true? Did no, someone? I'm oh, sorry. Um, so theology, the, the operating, uh, my always operating principle when it comes to theology is we have the story, we have the revealed revelation of the text of the Bible and of the person and work of Christ. And depending on how strongly you take it, the tradition and history of the church. So Catholics would take that stronger than Protestants. In term, so we have the story and we have the, the church's life uh, out in the world and in history. And then it's our job. So from the story, from the reveal text, it's, it's our job to try to draw principles to, um, from the story. So this is what I tell my students. I say, if you want to know what God's nature or what God, what the Bible, if you want to be biblically literate, what the Bible says about any topic is you need to find any reference, not just overt reference to that topic, but you need to find any story or any, any, uh, text that takes some sort of position on what that topic is, and then have that as, as evidence for saying biblical view about topics. So okay. I'll give you an example. And this is the one that I use in my English class or in my, in my uh, leadership class is like Exodus 21, where it says, um, if an ox gores a man, the ox shall be stoned to death. If the ox has a history of goring a man, then the ox's owner should be tried for it, should be stoned to death. The ox's owner could also pay a price to get out of stoning to death. And then the last one is, and if an ox gores a child, it's the same penalty. So, right. So you get this little story in the Old Testament. You can draw a bunch of principles about the, what God, about what Scripture says about certain things. One, children are just as valuable as adults. Like they have just as much inherent value. That may seem like an obvious duh, but you know there's biblical evidence that children are as valuable or are, are, has an inherent dignity as much as adults do. They're not like two thirds of an adult. So then let me. So I will quote two things that come from emails that we that we got in the last mm-hmm. few weeks so one of them is malachi 3 6 for i the lord do not change another mm-hmm. one first corinthians 10 5 nevertheless with most of them god was not pleased mm-hmm. okay so yeah uh, so when, La- or, job changed god's mind sure. right so we have the stories and now we've got to say okay what's going on here and um and i, and I would honestly say that there's probably been equal amounts of scripture quoted on both sides of things. Yeah. There's no one who's coming in and saying, ignore the scripture. 
uh, here's my logical argument. Go so, to first principles. Yeah, everyone's, or everyone's trying to. Yeah. Everyone is looking to Revelation as a source of answering this, and there's there are equal quotes and citations on both sides. Yeah, and I think that's that's sort of bedrock foundational. Is that if you're going to, if we are going to be people of the book, uh, then the book is is axiomatically taken as God's revealed word. Okay, then we can develop the theology about God's nature based on. The, reveal, the revelation, not only of his word, but also of what we see in the character and nature of Christ. So, um, yeah, so um, it gets real complicated because then we grafted in all of these Greek ideas into, into, the, into you know, the, the Jewishness. Um, Christianity is this mush of, of Jewishness and Greek ideals together uh, in, in culture and then also this, this work of, a, of, a, of, of Christ. So, that's where the impassibility has – you were talking about the sort of Hannenberg before. That's like the idea of God's impassibility is definitely um, sort of a hill that the more Hellenistic Christians are dying on than but it's maybe a, the – It's a logical one. So I guess my, my decision-making process always begins with the question, is it worth talking about? And I think that applies to philosophy. It applies to theology as well. You know, asking how many angels can dance on the head of a pin will not affect my day-to-day life. so fascinating. Sure, maybe, is, but... They can change size. It's interesting. Anyway. It, interesting, but is it going to change how I treat my neighbor? Probably not. This one might actually, right? Can God change? Is he immutable? Can he feel things or suffer? All those are big questions. How does God suffer? Yeah. How, how does God interact with the things that I do are all really good questions. And so then I think it's a process of go to scripture first, look at the context of the scriptures, and then go to looking at the men who have made the decision, and I think it's a twofold question there. What were the influences at play during those time periods? Like C.S. Lewis would say, what were, the, what were the typical downfalls of that time period that they were blind to, that we are no longer blind to? And then also coming with a sense of humility, thinking, well, I'm, what, a ninth grade English teacher? And I'm a theology major, but I, I'm not... I am not the same level as some of the people who've been in, in this argument for a long time. So I think coming with a sense of humility first and thinking, all right, listen, listen to these men and actually listen as a learner. And then if, if they conflict, then maybe I'll have to come to a decision. But come, come I guess, with a, a, a sense of humility on top of all of this. As far as the Greek thought coming into this, I know that I think the logic is that if if something is absolutely perfect, then any change admitted to its perfection must be a change away from perfection. Yeah. And that, so that's kind of the thought, is that if God suffers, then he is changing. And and it also means that something is powerful enough to inflict upon something him something he didn't necessarily want. Mm-hmm. And so that implies that there's a greater being or at least an equal being to God. And so there's, I think there's some logical things coming in here, but I also tend to think that the Hebraic tradition wouldn't have been as sensitive to those. I, I don't. Do okay. you not agree? No. So I just think it's, it's an, so we're, it's not necessarily even looking to tradition. It's like looking to influences of tradition. So I, I think you can just as easily point to the Greeks and look at the philosopher God that Aristotle talks about as mm-hmm. being impassable. Nothing impacts him. It's more yeah. of a deistic conception of God, but there is an idea of impassibility in Aristotle, but then you also, when you look at Greek mythology, the gods are not impassable by any means. They are deeply emotional. So yeah. I think you can just as easily find a passable, uh, you know, with passion. You can find gods with passion in, in Greek idea. You can find impassable ideas in Greek thought. And when when in, I say Greek, I'm speaking about, about a specific time period of Greek thought. I even, um, But even take it so even farther, if we, to look to Hebraic thought, look to the Old Testament, are there emotion words used about God? And the answer is yes. The answer mm-hmm. is of course. But then is there also a tradition that says that even with, that those emotion words are meant as metaphor? Yes. Mm-hmm. Like both are present in Old Testament writing. So I think we're still left at that same place of what do we do with that? And, and that's still the fundamental question. Like, what do we do with that? We could be Aryans and just say that the, every time we see the emotional God, we're talking about a created a lesser being. Mm-hmm. Um, what do we do with that? I mean, at some point, if you're butting up against God and trying to conceive of God, at some point, everything is going to be metaphor, (laughs) right? Um, uh, is God a father? Well, 
we get fatherhood from God. Like we understand the concept of fatherhood. So, I mean, eventually language is going to break down. Eventually all these things are going to be little imperfect parcels to attach to understanding, understanding God's nature. So, um, um, but this gets really crazy because God makes himself visible and communicable in space and time. And on that has seemingly has emotions and like thought processes and the ability to converse where someone says, but God, what about this? And he's like, ah, good idea. Mm -hmm. You know? And so, I mean, um, I, I, I don't, but then the theology doesn't, the theology of salvation doesn't work without an impassable God on the cross. And why is that? Because, um, and I should say we're referencing many emails from, from, uh, listeners at this point, right? Yeah. Well, let me look. I only say that as, a I don't thing. have the tip of my brain. Why oh. does salvation work with impass with a, if God is passable, if God can change, um, then, then the standard of goodness is called into question. And then, then the, his law changes. Mm -hmm. uh, if God can change, then, um, 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 then there's no, then, then the concept of holiness doesn't make sense. Yes. And that, so one of the listeners wrote in to talk about how if God is changing, then there, then we have to be really shaky about our understanding of eschatology, our yeah. understanding yeah, of yeah, end yeah. times, because mm -hmm. those things might not be true. They could have been true at one point in time. God then changes his mind. And then we have to figure that out. But then if God doesn't feels, which doesn't feels, if God doesn't feel or if Christ doesn't, if Christ really actually isn't suffering on the cross, then the story is sort of robbed of resonance or power. How can Christ have been tempted like we are tempted if suffering bounces off of him and he doesn't feel it? I think the distinction, the important distinction there is the, the key word in divine nature. Mm -hmm. if, if there are two natures commingled on the cross, then he can suffer in his human nature and not in his divine. Yep. Yeah. Which then will, that in a way that feels like the punchline, like in a way that's, that is the orthodox position at the end of it. But again, this is orthodoxy set 1500 years ago. Like that's, I'm asking why it matters uh, essentially. Like, so people said this over a thousand years ago, like, but we have gotten many responses that don't just say this was established. This is what has been said in the church tradition. Therefore we hold to it. That's why I'm asking, does it matter what was said? 1500 years ago. Totally. Why? Because, um, well, because the logic of it hasn't changed. So the theology, so Christ being divine and being human, and we've talked about, you know, we've, we've, I just said it right now, like we need that for, for salvation to make sense. So the fact that they, that they crystallized it 1500 years ago, um, doesn't make the logic of it any less persuasive. Mm -hmm. Um, um, but there, so, this is a, this is also from listener email in some ways, the passability of God, God being with passion, God capable of suffering is it's sometimes called the new orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. I'm using um, air quotes as I say that largely in follow up to world war two. And yeah. How the, can you have, yes. How can you have a God, the who is, horrors of the yes, world without a God who understands and identifies with that suffering? Mm hmm. It depends what the conclusion you're wanting from that is. Like, so there's a definitely a modern conceit that somehow suffering is more noble than not suffering. And you see this creep into the stories that we tell. And I, I've talked about this before, that like the, the tortured hero somehow seems to, should be, is, is um, um, set up as somebody who should be taken more seriously as the joyful hero. Mm -hmm. That like Superman is naive, and so you need dark Superman, brooding Superman. Mm -hmm. um, and somehow... Like, um, uh, the brooding hero that's always walking around Gotham in the rain or whatever is somehow more serious. So if we, if we're, if we are falling into the trap that the suffering God is somehow more of a serious God than the, than the God of joviality and mirth, mm -hmm. then I think that's a bad conclusion to come away from by saying, therefore, we need to really read God as someone who can suffer. Um, I don't think that's what new orthodoxy was getting at it maybe at the beginning. They were really trying to understand, um, you know, the, the horrors of the 20th century. Um, I just, what do you get? What, what do you get from a God who, what is it? What, what do they want? Feels really bad about it? 
or, or um, identifies with or it. identifies with it. But what, what is the, um, yeah, I, again, maybe this is, this is more of a modern taste is that we want, we want our leaders or we want those who are in authority or power over us to get us Yes, in the same way that we feel it. And we don't be, we don't feel that if somebody understands what we're going through cognitively, but not experientially that, that, that they somehow don't understand it. Um, you want to understand this. You're not a parent. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not a parent. I don't have a child, but I mean, I can understand a lot of it, yep. but I, I feel like a lot of people reject that as saying, <coughs> if you haven't, if you haven't lived it, you don't get it. Yep. And I feel like we're, we're putting that standard on God as well. And I, and I feel like, so if that's the motivation for doing it, that's, that doesn't seem to be the wrong motivation. There needs to be a logical flow. There needs to be a th sort of a, a theological reason as opposed to just um, a modern taste reason. Sure. I agree. I think all those are, are valid points. The, the direction I'm pushing this toward is a tool that incorporates all of these things. And I think it's one we've talked on this podcast about and one I know that we teach in our leadership classes. So uh, the tool is the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Is this one that you all use? I do not know this. Oh, never mind. Okay. So uh, it, I was raised Methodist, so maybe this is why I think uh, it's like your the best. heart was strangely warm. Strangely warm. I'm all about Alders Gate. I so. was raised Anglican, so my heart was strangely <laughs> cooled. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess and you're not going to a Methodist church now, though. I was going to say we, tr we traded places, but that's not exactly right. So <laughs> Wesleyan quadrilateral. It, so it, you know, it has John Wesley's name on it, but John Wesley did not make a thing called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. This is based on people reading Wesley and saying this is how he made decisions. So the parts of this quadrilateral. So quad mm -hmm. you know, four mm -hmm. lateral shape it's a anyway it's a four-pointed i usually do it as a square when i'm talking about it in class but so there are four points to the square those four points are scripture tradition reason and experience scripture tradition reason and experience so as opposed to the three-legged stool which is just scripture tradition and reason sure. no is it i think i'm right I don't know. I don't know three legged stool. Should I know that one? No, nah, that's fine. Okay, good. So, uh, and again, this is, uh, I, I think in the 20th century is when it was like kind of codified into a system. So, anyway, a, an important question is which of those four do you put at the top? Yeah. So, and, and that what I think has been more interesting in just reading responses is to understand like how, how do we primarily understand these issues. And then if there are conflicts at one level, like what do you, what do you appeal to next? Like what is the next thing that you look at? So in understanding what's your order, maybe scripture, scripture first, I would, uh, so to rank all four would be scripture, tradition, reason, experience. Wow. I think, I, I think I would, I would probably, I would probably flip tradition and reason. I would probably okay. do scripture, reason, tradition, experience. Yeah. But I was a low church angle. Okay. <laughs> Hannenberg, do you have a response on this one? I'm hoping you'll like put experience first experience <laughs> good good great feeling uh -huh. yeah, good. Uh -huh. keep going if it's cool music or not. what music. the music yeah. tells yeah. me yeah what my, what my feels are uh -huh. i i think scripture obviously first and then if by I'm, I'm having trouble differentiating between tradition as in things that Christians always do and blindly accept versus ah, this is great. the blindly. The, what do I call it blindly? But, but the, the, I, it's an important blindly yep. accept versus yep. the tradition of the church established by biblical scholars from ages past, right? Yeah. Who I gladly typically submit to yep. so long as their logic checks out. Yeah. So then reason before tradition. You just said that's, so long as their logic checks out, you, I would assume uh, you would put reason above it, but not, but, but I mean, like, if when traditions come into clash with each other, mm -hmm. like, often there yep. are traditional scholars in the Christian church mm -hmm. that are both accepted and sometimes disagree with each mm -hmm. other. So if multiple traditional scholars disagree with each other, I'll have to bring my own reason to bear. Mm -hmm. If I'm coming up against several and repeated scholars that all say the same thing and hold the same position, I'm usually not in a place to supplant their reason. Yep. It might be that I don't understand it. It might be that I'm just inadequate. Um, I, I try to be as humble as I can when coming to these things. That's, mm -hmm. that's why I try not to pass, you know, judgment on Karl Barth or, mm -hmm. or Calvin without having read what they actually said, yep. instead of just kind of assuming a simplified argument of theirs and then moving on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yep. So I, in tradition, I mean the codified logical tradition of the church and scholars, and then moving on to my own reason and then moving on to experience. Great. But then 
so part of the part of the trouble is that so part of the problem is that my reaction to many people saying I don't agree with this is to be like, well, what if I appeal? What if I quote a church father? Like, will that do it for you? Or what if I like? Mm-hmm. Or what does it matter if it's taught in the? So again, we're classical stuff. So when we talk about the classical church, the historic church, we are essentially talking about Catholicism, like an ancient form of Catholicism. Someone's anyway. If you want to, there's the, and there's the Eastern Fathers sure, too. Totally, yeah, uh, totally true. Just to say that. So if I were to say, hands that, off my icons, Thomas. <laughs> more power to you. So if I were to say that it's taught in the Catechism of the Catholic Church that God is impassable, does that have any bearing on this conversation? Is that an answer to this conversation? It ought. To, it ought to have some bearing. It doesn't and have no bearing. Is then what what mm-hmm. amount of bearing does it have? Is that is that fair? So yeah, it's that it that it didn't. The the conclusion did not come willy nilly. Yeah. I think is is. Um, the answer. Um, I think that it that it's covered in the catechism hints at a long schol- scholastic tr- tradition mm-hmm. that you can go read. Mm-hmm. Like you can go find those things, and there are some things that that change over time. Right? Sure. We just had a new council that is still the traditions and the thoughts of that council are still working its way into the lower echelons of the church. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, stuff, you got it sitting on your shelf over there. Yeah, stuff changed the at II. the top, and yeah, the Vatican sure. II council, which yeah. by the way happened in the, like within the last century, mm-hmm. and we're talking a council like mm-hmm. the Council of Worms. Like this is a huge deal, and we're still seeing the effects ripple out in the church. Yeah. So if I have a question, I can go look at Vatican II and at previous councils and at previous scholars and mm-hmm. sort of dive into this tradition and see if there's a consensus. Protestants, I, instead of having councils, just start new congregations. That. So, <laughs> and, and that's, I, I don't know this for sure, but many of the uh, listener responses coming back have been from Protestants. Sure. Right? So then that's just why I wonder, like, do, like, to what degree does tradition matter or even what type of tradition matters in that context? So I think, I, I think it's an open question, but I would just say that, that my default in many things is to say, at some level, the reason heresies exist is because of a difference in reason. Like, no, heretics, I, I use that word, and I know it has the negative connotation, but people disagree over something because they are reasoning differently. They both believe that they're orthodox, and until a position is determined by the church, like, it's an open disagreement, and then heresy is set. Yeah, Um Josh Gibbs has, I, I think I'm remembering it clearly, he's someone who we've talked about in the podcast, we reviewed one of his books, essentially has a line that he repeats a couple times or this little idea that he, that he repeats every now and then that he prefers students that are hardline Lutheran or hardline Catholics who are willing to fight about the jots and tittles of theology as opposed to student that's like, well, I just believe in the things that we can all agree on and, uh, and I try not to get, I try not to let those divisions really, really bother me. There's something sort of... Um, you know, milk toast about not caring about these things. That's probably belying a deeper um, indifference to God um, and dressing it up as virtue Mm -hmm. that, oh, I'm doing this just for unity. Um, Whereas somebody that really wants to, uh, really wants to go back and forth about the the tenets of Lutheranism and versus the tenets of of Catholicism. um, There is a... um, there's a difference between owning it and defending it to try to understand it and not owning it, not defending it, and then not understanding it and then saying that that's probably better because you're keeping the peace. Right. <laughs> well, I was actually just going to say almost the opposite. <laughs> oh. So I, whenever I come to questions like this one, and this one seems – it seems to be on the, the far edges of theology, right? If If it – if it leans one way or it leans the other way, what it seems to affect, and this is, again, I'm, I'm but a babe as far as okay. these questions go. It what seems a, to affect what a babe. Is a babe. Yeah. What a that's, babe. The quote that's how I like yeah. to describe myself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a babe in these things. Yeah. I'm a babe in all things. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems to me that it affects the way that we view, you know, those words about how he feels about our conditions. It affects, you know, can, I guess... His, his changeableness isn't, doesn't seem to be really at an issue. It's just whether or not he can feel bad, right? So, the, the, I mean, it's not... Uh, so, just to, just to repeat that, because I think that, that matters. The, the specific question that's being asked in the... So, if we're only talking about heresy, the question is, on the cross, did Christ suffer? Did Christ's divine nature suffer, right? Right. It's so, a really specific question. Yes. And in these questions that seem... So, Graham's mm-hmm. giving me the... No, the no, I'm guy. just... My... Give me a second. So, in these, in these questions that seem 
really lofty and complicated and have things like really solid arguments on both sides, they're, I think, with a healthy... The, the spirit of an in, inquisitor? I mean, that's the wrong word. <laughs> Someone, an someone inquisitive who, spirit. Yeah, that, an inquisitive okay. spirit. You, you, want, never you have to it. want to know things, but there has to be a certain point at which you say... There, I, I am trying to torture a question out of God when he has asked certain things of me. And I can at some point say, like, I am humble enough to not know this. And, but God has asked certain things and I will do those things. It seems like a cop out, but it, it feels much to me like the situation Job was in, right? He had a, a legitimate beef. He's like, I have lived righteously. And the principles, so far as I understand them of scripture means that these bad things should not happen to me. And then God's response to him was not a defense. It was a, who are you? Yeah. Sit down. You don't get to ask me these questions. Yep. Right. And so I have, I always have that in the back of my mind as I investigate these questions. Like at a, at a certain point, if the answer is yet unclear, mm-hmm. I still have some answers from God and those answers aren't an answer to the question that I want him to answer. The answer is do good to your neighbor and be charitable and help the poor. Like that he has given me things that I am supposed to do. And so I can, I should of course always be questing and questioning, but sometimes like those kids who say, you know, I just don't necessarily want to take a side on this. I, I have a heart for him. It, I may, it makes sense to me in some cases. Mm-hmm. I see it kind of as like a hockey fight what? where you shake hands at the end. Like yes. the, 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 the two sides are going are working through some sort of, some kind of uh, uh, process about a question about God's nature. But at the end, if there's not a revel- if there's not a realization that you are both still playing the game, um, then that's wrong. So I think, so this is uh, an email that we received whose conclusion was um, the, the sort of the definition of heretic should be seen as somebody who obstinately then continues to work at dividing the church, whether that's a local congregation or the church writ large. And that can be done with holding a position that is outside the bounds of orthodoxy, or that can be done just by being like a gossipy jerk. And if a gossipy jerk who can like pass the Christian tests on orthodoxy is still being like, did you see what Nancy did? And then really harps on poor Nancy to the point where Nancy and her husband have to leave the church. And that person is also dividing. That that person is the heretic. They right. are using their obstinacy and what, and they're fast holding to whatever that particular sin is. In this case, gossip and slander, or calumny or whatever. And um, um, and that person is is like wounding the church by driving somebody out of it. Then that's that's a that's heresy. That's a that is a, a division of the church. I, I was. It's, it's weird to use the word heresy because we think that. about it in a, in a completely different way. But right. that's the uh, we that's say, the sort of way to think about it. Yeah. Because, and I, I read the quote last time that we would typically look at that as a as a schismatic, especially historically. But I, I hear the point, and the problem in heresy is not believing something different. That is, uh, Paul commends a congregation for holding many opinions so that they can figure out the right one. But yet, I forget the exact quote, but I believe it's that. The schismatic is in opposition to love, while the person who eventually will be called a heretic, at the point we're talking about it, it's two people who hold different views. They're a heretic if they hold to that view, even after being told that argument has been settled. Yeah. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. But again, I thought that was a very thoughtful email, so I appreciated that. Okay. So the point I'm driving at with bringing in the quadrilateral, and I hope someone is thinking to themselves, why are we using a modern tool to address something that came more than a thousand years before it, which I think is a helpful question is that I think, I think it matters where theopascatism as a new orthodoxy comes from. It matters that it, it's re reemergence, reemergence, resurgence is coming mm-hmm. from trying to address the experience that people have of significant suffering in the 20th century, that in looking at world war II, seeing that, seeing the, the human suffering that's occurring, they then, someone would look and then say, therefore God must also share in that suffering. So while each of us at this table disagreed at what was second and third, we all put experience last of mm-hmm. our four. Is mm-hmm. that correct? So yeah. if something is coming into new light because of experience, I think that is, that is cause for question. Is there some logical fallacy I'm making right now? No, I, I, I don't think so. Um, 
No, I don't think so. Okay, that's what that, that's all I wanted to make sure. So I think that is one thing to think about that there has been an established if if tradition is above experience, it matters that the church, Big C Church, has held a certain position for a long time. And we would call that tradition. Whether we agree with it or not, then falls into reason. Is that mm-hmm. fair? I mean, this is the same, you can see the same kind of argument that comes up in questions of sexual ethics. Mm-hmm. Um, um, when we were kids, so we didn't even realize it was happening, the church was going through the big questions, maybe from the 60s and 70s, of how do we now exist in a world where divorce is becoming more uh, socially acceptable. And, um, you know, the church has a pretty scripture when it comes on, when it comes to divorce has pretty um, not as ambiguous claims about what, what makes divorce acceptable than maybe we are now led to believe that it does. Uh, I don't want to get into the, to the nuances of it, but I'm just, but I just want to say that like um, every age it has experiences that the church needs to react to and the church has a decision of whether or not they're going to let the experiences um, interpret the text yes, or whether they're going to let the text um, have authority over the experiences. Yeah. That, that's the this point. is kind of like the Christ in culture, Christ above culture. The, 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 what's this, that guy's name? I have no idea. Um, the, the American theologian um, – I can't remember his uh, name. Him and his brother. Richard Niebuhr? Yeah, Niebuhr. Yeah. I was going to say, like, um, Newhouse, but that's a that's a designer. Yeah, Niebuhr, Richard Niebuhr. So the Christ in culture, Christ from culture um, kind of argument um, of, are you going to let the culture drive the interpretation of the story, um, or are you going to let the tradition um, give boundaries to the experience? Right. Uh, and that's a... That's a and I think tradition giving boundaries to experience is something that we have no taste for in the modern world. Right. Yes. Um, and, uh, and that comes up in yeah, uh, the modern questions of sexual ethics that the church is going through in regards to gender and, and um, sexual, homosexuality. Uh, question, and then a generation before questions of the divorce, generations before um, um, questions of, you know, um, yeah. Anyway, it's just. Uh, Can you let an atheist serve as a priest? Yes. Yeah. All those sorts of. There's there's all one these kinds of things. in Canada that's recently happened yeah. where a woman declared she didn't believe in God and wanted to mm-hmm. remain a minister. Yeah. And so she's in the United Methodist Church. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Hey, I have, of, I've been yeah, yeah, been to those churches where they change. Well, it's United Methodist. No. Um, they uh, they have altered the hymn books to take out any references to Jesus and um, and God and replaced them with sort of milk toast uh, um, sort of happy feelings. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of one on the top of my head, but I can't. But you're getting to the larger point. So, AJ, I th- you know, the first time any of us heard of theopascatism was like last episode or like the book I read about it. Like this isn't a thing we're talking about all the time. But the or, broad point. you know, I seminary 12 years ago or whatever it was right. for me. Right. And then right. I haven't sure, thought about sure, it sure. since. I don't think my theology degree ever delved that far. Yeah. Which is not me saying it's not an important issue, because I think some of you might hear me saying that. I don't think that. But it's kind of like uh, uh, Aquinas had these like funny thoughts where he's like, in the Summa, it's like, I'm writing this book, and it's going to have all these like theological points in it, but not everyone needs to read this book. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, knowledge of salvation is, uh, you don't need to read this book to be saved, is, this an, is like an Aquinas thing. And so in the same way with theopascatism, like getting people to agree 100% on that is kind of not the point. Mm-hmm. But how you think about what you think about that issue has broader implications, not just for one theological point, but even cultural points, even for how we approach literature, like why it matters. I think that's the bigger, more important question. Yeah, like the difference between a medieval understanding of community and a modern understanding of, of community. So, for example, I think as modern people, if someone says the summa is really good, mm-hmm. We, and it has, and contains a lot of truth about Christian life, we would say, oh my goodness, I as an individual person need to know it and read it and understand it. Whereas in the Middle Ages, I think it's, I, I think I would be right in this saying if someone said, oh, the Summa is really good and it contains a lot of truth about, uh, well, let me characterize it. Someone said in modern world, so the modern person, the Summa is really good. It contains a lot of Christian truth. Um, uh, but you don't need to read it because, you know, it's it's really long. You don't need to read it. I think a lot of people say, well, I'm, I, I sh- if it's good, I should know it. Right. And in the Middle Ages, if someone said the Summa is really good, it contains a lot of Christian truth, and you don't need to read it, the Middle Ages person would say, well, aren't I glad that somebody's thinking about this that's going to influence the community or influence, 
you know, everybody. Like we have this idea that if, if something is good, we as an individual person should also have internalized it into ourselves. Well, and evaluated maybe, it. And evaluated Taking it. only the pieces that we... That's like. right. And maybe not trust that it's goodness, it's going to work itself out in the community that we can benefit from. No, no, no. My brother is not going to be able to, to do this. I should read it and analyze it for myself on my own rights. And I mean, I think we have a lot of sympathy for that argument as modern people, and we can flesh out a lot of error, but it also does mean that there's a lot of community fracturing because yeah. um, AJ reads it and I read it and we read the same thing. We come to different conclusions and we're head pig headed and obstinate. And then, um, this, no, this is great. Cause then, speak for yourself. But I if, am not, pig headed. <laughs> but if AJ is, you know, if Perfect. AJ is, oh, well. is, uh, is, you know, the abbot and I'm the monk, right. then I just sort of say, well, he's the abbot and I'm right. the monk. Right. Um, but AJ and I are, you know, And then the commoner equals. says they're the monks. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. And I say, no, we're, we're you know, we're equals and um, equals the wrong word, but we are, we are on the same, you know, no one can tell me what to do. No one can tell me what to think. Did you and, just say we're not equals? <laughs> um, no, 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 no. no. I was that, saying that, but that, that the abbot and the monk in, saying in, they weren't yeah, equals okay. was the wrong thing to uh, they are, in fact, they are equal as in they are both made in God's image. Gonna get, we're going to get the angry email about this one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think um, you're right. I, C.S. Lewis authority. talks about... Authority. It's just we have problems with authority. Yes. Yeah. C.S. Lewis talks about the medievals as being credulous. They are... They believe their authors. Yes. And, yes. And There's part, charity for those they read. Yeah. Charity for those they read. And part of that is that it's... I, I think there's, there's several things that play into it. I think one, lack of printing press. Right, the books were not as available, and so not everyone could read them. You didn't have access to all the information, and so you had to believe the people that did, yeah. or the people that had had access. And you couldn't travel everywhere. You might spend your entire life in a hundred mile square mm -hmm. area, right. and so if someone came back and they're like, "I saw a dragon over there, and it had crazy horns and barked like a dog," you'd be like, "That is bananas!" And I have to believe you because mm -hmm. there's that's the only way we can do it. Right now, if, if you and I both wanted to dedicate our lives to it, we could read the works of every major theologian. You could. It would take mm -hmm. a long time, but you could do it and then become yourself an expert. That and we was could not... afford to do it. We could find the books on Amazon and for a couple thousand dollars, we could get enough books to read that, to take up our whole lives. Right. If you wanted to read the Summa, there might be a copy and it might be at a seminary yeah, yeah. and it might be within a thousand miles right there just it just wasn't possible and so you it's not that everyone just was more humble i think it's that you had to be you had to take authority if you wanted this thing to work there had to be a higher degree and level of trust than we have now so are you making a positive or negative comment because i see both um, sides yeah i'm just saying that that's that's the situation they found themselves in and, yeah. it, and it meant that they had to believe and they had to trust and and i think yeah i think part of it is humility right they knew that they're not plato mm -hmm. right <laughs> i think there there might be a lot of us today that, yeah. that we are the downside is is that you you need to trust authority and then there's a fragility to that because the authority can be tyrannical and then you're there's nothing you can do or if you've set up that trusting authority is what we need to do and then you have someone who's a bad authority and everyone's like well we still gotta trust them this sucks right um but now we still let's not kid ourselves there is a social cost to having a wide amount of easily accessible information and easily and making information easy to create. Mm -hmm. And we are now in a wash of, of, of trust issues. We have yes. no idea what we can trust online well, we or just, written. We just, and we've, people use, they, they hack into people's phone records. We just saw that thing with Jeff Bezos came out where yeah. he was being blackmailed mm -hmm. and brought out the blackmail. And yeah. I don't think like, you know, even in the, even in the, uh, the 70s, during uh, you know the height of Vietnam, the, uh, the idea that the editorial board of the Washington Post were heroes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and now I feel like, I, uh, no, I don't think that people trust editorial boards of newspapers, or at least see them in the same kind of light as, as, as maybe they did back in the back in the day, Watergate, right? Mm -hmm. Like journal, journalism as, as holding the public trust in the public good. I think there's a huge crisis of confidence in, you know, journalism. Um, but is the, is the problem the confidence or is it the people who are in those positions? So when AJ talks about Cicero and that it's good men who are put into those positions of authority, you trust a system where that's the social pressure, but I don't know. My, the, the question I'm driving at with this one is, so both, so we all put, tradition below scripture like i don't know mm -hmm. like, yeah why is that We're like are, 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 are we just overly critical of tradition or is there something fundamentally 
that we should be nervous about in tradition? Um, I, 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 yeah, I think we have a we have a nervousness about tradition, um, and I think there, there's an important distinction, right? Bible is inspired. Mm-hmm. Yes, but let me phrase it this way: the we read English translations of the Bible. English translations are done by humans who translate those Bibles <coughs> and pick words to go there. And if you've ever said this translation is better than this other translation, you've said you said essentially tradition. this tradition yeah. is better than this tradition, or this authority is better than this authority. We don't mm-hmm. think of it that way, but I think that matters. Like, there's still. And even if we read uh, original language um, collections of them, anyway, there are still choices that have to be made there. There are so. easier claims to, ob- to not perfect objectivity, but it is easier to have more objective claims about it when AJ and I can sit and open the Bible yeah. and both turn to Matthew 14 yep. and say, this, no, this, no, this, no, this. When you're talking about tradition and you're talking about history, you have a bigger, you have one more layer of abstraction in that you have the person who wrote the history or the tradition in the way that it came down and then the actual facts that happened on the ground. So, yes, there is an interpretation layer in Scripture from the facts that happened on the ground, but at least if we say that the words themselves are inspired and come to us, now they come to us through the tradition, right? and they come it, to us right. through the church, the church councils that said... Which books go in there. That said, you know, Jude made it. Or that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know... Third Corinthians, you know, there's no third Corinthians, you know what I mean? Like, doesn't make it. Um, and then Protestants say, eh, the Apocrypha, Maccabees, you're gone. Right. Um, so, which in that sense, tradition. which is also tradition. So, it's, um, um, but there is something a little bit more accessible to Scripture than tradition. Sure. And that's in that we can sit down and hash it out. Yeah. It, that... Yeah, that there's a difference between revelation and reason is, I think, a, a totally fine place to mm-hmm. land on that one. Um, and putting revelation above reason makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I'm on board for all that stuff. So again, the the only the point I'm driving at just with this whole conversation is it matters how you're thinking about these issues. Probably more. Well, this might I don't know. It matters what conclusions you come to. But I think it's really easy to talk past people in having these conversations, mm-hmm. and even in reading the emails, it's just been so funny of like people focus on different of those four elements. And so mm-hmm. then they can't really talk to each other. Mm-hmm. So I think there's open disagreement of like what a plain text reading of scripture is. So the scripture reading, there's kind of like, there's a way to, I'm not saying they're inconsistent. I'm just saying that like read on its face to say that God is both unchanging and also pleased and unpleased that can be seen as like, that needs to be reconciled. Mm-hmm. So then we have to go to the other tools to understand how to reconcile those things. Yeah. So, okay, bear with me on this. I okay. think motivation is a big part of this. So imagine you have a a four quadrants. You have a graph. Mm-hmm. And on the y-axis, that's the up and down one, right? That's x. And then the oh, other. the x is... Right. You know, y is up and down, x is side to side. Yes. So on the y-axis, going up, so at the top you have honest, pure motivations. Okay. You, you have like, you know, you're doing this for the right reasons. You want, you're lo- seeking after truth. Mm-hmm. And so the further down, you have bad motivations. You don't care about truth. Mm-hmm. All right. And then on the X axis, going to the right, you have a belief in a partic- you have belief in a particular view. And on the left, you have disbelief in a particular view. So okay. if we're talking about God's divine nature mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, so in the top right quadrant, you have right reasons and belief in the view. So you can call that sort of the true believer. Mm-hmm. Um, below that one on the right, you have right belief, but with the wrong motivations. So you could probably call that like rent seeking Mm -hmm. or, um, virtue signaling, or just trying to put on, you know, trying to appear right, but you don't really care about it. You don't really care about the truth of it. You're just, you're just saying you believe in it so that you can be in the group or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think we would say that that is a suspect way of operating with, with things. You... You don't mm-hmm. teach scripture, you hit people with yeah. it. Yeah. On the down and to the left, you have bad motivations and disbelief in something. You are just, you know... We, 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 cynic? Cynic, a cad. You are... Uh, um, just a real bummer to or, hang around. Or somebody who is uh, completely outside of, of any... He doesn't care about you know, doesn't care about truth, and he doesn't care about believing. He doesn't even want to engage with it, with the thing. So you, they can either be like um, he's they have, apathetic, yeah, or they are the frothing heretics who want to burn everything down. But then that top left quadrant is a really interesting one: is that they care about truth, but they don't believe the thing, but they have the right motivations for it. 
um, they want to know and they want to. So they're more like first principles thinkers or they are contrarian by nature um, uh, or they haven't been convinced. And I feel like those people still are needed in the church. Is that so? But we often see those people as the bottom left quadrant yes. that they are. They are, you know, the bad. Right. Uh, and then just let me let me finish on this. And then so and then the bottom the bottom right quadrant, we c- have a hard time distinguishing them from the top right quadrant. Um, so the bottom right quadrant, you may want to draw this if you're listening to this, I'm is, it over here. is the people who are doing it. They don't really care whether it's true or not. They just want to, you know. They believe they, the true thing, but they do it for the wrong motive. Or they don't even believe in the true thing. They just sort of see that the group thinks that believing in the true thing is important. So they get social currency by signaling that they also believe it, even though they don't really care about it. Uh, and then there's the true believers. I mean, that's a little helpful metric uh, that I've seen expressed towards just any sort of social issue. Um, the top left, uh, a good example would be Henry Fairley. Have you guys ever read him? Mm-mm. He wrote a book called The Seven Deadly Sins Today. And he, it was all about the seven deadly sins, and it's an excellent book. But at, in the preface, he says, I'm, I'm not a believer. I'm like a fanboy. Mm-hmm. I want to believe, and I, I think that all the thoughts are good. I'm just not there yet. Like, I haven't, I don't have true faith. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the kind of person you're talking about in the top left, someone who really cares about the truth and really wants to go there, but just doesn't, doesn't quite Mm -hmm. believe yet. So then someone like Rob Bell, who comes out and writes a book saying that hell no longer exists, you then have a big decision to make is, is he, is he top left or is he bottom left? Right? Um, Like, is he, is he wanting to maybe... If he's not believing in the doctrine of hell, is he doing it with, and his motivation is seeking after truth or has he actually stopped believing in this and he's try, and he's throwing a bomb in there um, and there's other motivations going on for writing this book? You know, so it's it's yeah. it's a yeah, motivate. So I say this to mean that Motivation's I think motivation is a really important aspect to this. And I think that's what you're getting at yeah. with talking about what are the modern reasons why we would want to have impassibility or not impassibility. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Does this, so we've referenced before, Graham gave a, gave a talk at the school not too long ago. One of your categories were rebels, one of the four. Would mm-hmm. that would that fall in that category? They have good motivations, but not. I, uh, what I was getting at with that is, I think, like a different, okay, a different, different. Um, a different heuristic altogether. Yeah. But I think it's a helpful way of dividing that up. So I, I guess where we land this then is to say that there are different ways of approaching Yes, a theological, but also like a cultural, like pick, pick your topic. There are different ways of approaching it. But I think what we would say on, because this is classical stuff, is that there are better and worse ways to rank your sources of information. There are better mm-hmm. and worse ways to say. So, yeah, seeing um, divine revelation as being something that is more important than reason, um, we would say is a better way of thinking about it than putting reason over revelation. Mm-hmm. So, My dad, whenever we would have theological discussions, and I think this kind of crystallizes my thoughts on it. Um, he would always sort of jokingly say if somebody was in opposition to it, well, you know, he'll come around eventually. <laughs> but the but when you sort of really think about that, I don't think he was being sort of being a toot about it. He was basically meaning if the person honestly cares about truth and is hungry and thirsting after God and will honestly follow God, God will bring that kind of soul into right understanding so if you stay above the x-axis right like if you keep the honesty in in wanting to seek after truth i think that that is obviously a better position to be than if you're below the x-axis where you fall on that y-axis is then i think aj what you're getting at kind of less important not that these things aren't important but that the honest soul seeking after understanding is a much more important than the dishonest soul who sort of figures out the right things to say and can sort of go along to get along yeah the i think your your point is that the people in the top left top left quadrant Mm -hmm. non-believing seekers will eventually find themselves in the top right yes yeah um whatever that top right is (laughs) Believing people who seek after believe, yes, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. but also hold orthodox positions. They will eventually if they if the orthodox positions are in fact what's the what um, God needs them to believe in order to work in the church. Yeah, it's the um, I think it's Aquinas that truth is the conformity of reality uh, of the mind with reality. 
And yeah, yeah, exactly. So to say that mm-hmm. if you are genuinely seeking after reality of what is actually true, you'll eventually find you'll eventually it. come to that point where you got to conform to it or make the obvious. No, I'm going to stay in my un- disbelief. my disbelief because it's comfortable, easy. The opposite is too hard, which so, would probably move you below the x-axis. Yeah. Maybe. Mm-hmm. So let's find examples of these. So the top right axis would be Superman. Okay. A well, top left. Why Superman? Uh, he's he believes in right things and okay. he, like Captain America. Yeah, Captain okay. America. Right. He's he's your quality good guy. Mm-hmm. Bottom left would probably be Joker. Mm-hmm. Right. He just wants to see the world burn. He's got horrible motives. He doesn't believe in anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, top left, Catwoman. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. She's not doing the right thing, but she she there's a code there and she will eventually hopefully be in the right place. Who's bottom right? They know the right things, but they don't do it like uh, some sort of yes man politician mm. knows the right things, but doesn't do them um, or just goes along to get along, but doesn't really care about it. Michelangelo, the Ninja Turtle. <laughs> Does he just go along with things? Or it's like Robin. <laughs> he does it yeah <laughs> he's like i want to be i want to be right. a superhero right. i don't really you know just want to fall that's one cool stuff i don't know i don't yeah, know he, I don't know he doesn't have his, of... his inner core values yeah, yeah. if you're a robin fan please i'm so sorry in this case don't email us. that's fine <laughs> i'm not sure it's important enough <laughs> to, to worry yeah. about or if you have a better pop culture icon that can stick in the i know right. someone's going to email us with what the heuristic you should use is chaotic neutral and yeah and oh, lawful the good and lawful oh, neutral oh man no i'm okay with that man awesome uh, maybe, maybe it's a like a pop figure who changes their look just to stick with the times like yeah. that kind of thing bad yeah. motivations are not seeking truth yeah like madonna like, like just a, sort of reinventing themselves to, to yeah, stay like a band current. that yeah, yeah. that sells out their their roots for something else yeah they used to play metal but now they play bubblegum pop oh the best are you thinking of someone like green day oh actually green day never played anything good <laughs> wow. what okay they, they had a couple of good albums fight me bro <laughs> All right. so, I, I love that song. Which fight me, bro? <laughs> no, song? No. Yeah, it's not. All right, that's all I got. Cool. Well, um, this has been classical stuff you should know. I think you're not sure. Um, uh, I don't know what to think anymore. No, oh, um, we thank you for listening. This has been uh, uh, a conversation that I found personally enriching and just interesting. So thank you, Thomas, for that. If you have questions or comments, I can't think of any reason why you would after an episode like this. <laughs> right. You can email us at classical stuff at veritasacademy.net. You can go to classical stuff.net and see what picture AJ chose for this episode. You can download, not us, you can download uh, our episode at any podcast disseminator on the interwebs. Um, and except for Spotify, except for Spotify. Got to figure out the Spotify. Where and you can tweet at us at Classical Stuff. If you are the owner of at Classical Stuff, hey man, we want your handle. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, bruh. Bruh. And you have not tweeted since 2011, so what What? What the junk. Um, anyway, uh, you can tweet at us and well, I will- it's classical. It's literally yeah. <laughs> classical stuff. Yeah. It's been around for a long time. I will like and retweet uh, things, um, and I will try to do a better job of retweeting pertinent things to our discussion, like how I recently retweeted- um, the song um, Lip Gloss by Little Mama oh, because that you. came up in an episode a little while ago. Thank you for the So if, in case yeah. anybody didn't know Lip Gloss by Little Mama, what you know about me, I put it on the uh, on the tweets. It's a so, great song. It's, and it's, I have personally made a remix of it's that. It's a middle school jam. I mean, that's a good... Over a Todd Terge song, if you guys no want idea to. What that you, is. Can you share that? Where is it? Uh, I, I think it would be illegal for me to share Never it. Mind, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So this is the three AJ, Thomas, and Graham signing off from Classical Stuff, and we'll catch you next time. Next Bye. time. Bye. Bye.